Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Um, this is the second uh, in the series of uh, sustainability lectures, and I wanted to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, I've got a number of announcements to make uh, prior to introducing our speakers. Um, the Sunnyvale Sustainability Commission um, is um, organizing this series of, of um, uh, city-sponsored uh, events. And I'm Steve Zornitzer. I'm a member of the Sustainability Commission. Myself and Crystal Wickham, who's over there, um, are helping to organize this series. I'd like to acknowledge a number of people first um, as before we get into the, the events of the evening. I'd like to thank the Sunnyvale City Council, uh, first and foremost, for their forward thinking, um, their vision in positioning our city to take a responsible and proactive approach in env to environmental sustainability. I think this is very important, not only for Sunnyvale, but for California, for the nation, and for the world. I'd like to thank this, the staff of the uh, city's environmental services division, who've done a really great job in helping to organize these events. And in particular, I'd like to thank uh, Napur Hiramath, uh, the city's sustainability coordinator. Where is Napur? Right there. Uh, and Elaine Marshall, both of whom really did the bulk of the planning and promotion for tonight's event. So thank you both very much. I've got some housekeeping things to mention. Um, first of all, restrooms. They're located right outside on either, either side of the lobby if you need to use the restrooms. All food and drink uh, really is prohibited in this uh, council chamber. So if you've brought food or drink in, please take it back out. Um, hopefully you haven't brought it in. Um, again, I guess because of this is California, I guess I should also add that in an emergency, you know, please exit orderly and go outside. Uh, I, I just, I know that uh, at NASA where I work before every talk, somebody says that and so we sort of have to do that. Um, this event is being live broadcast on KSUN TV, and uh, it's being recorded and will be available in the archives for other people to uh, take advantage of uh, what we're going to hear tonight uh, in the future. So, um, and your questions at the end, uh, after our speakers talk, uh, will also be uh, recorded. So we're going to give you a microphone. Uh, please wait for someone to come and hand you a microphone before you ask your question. I want to uh, add that there is a um, uh, clipboard on the back table on the left hand side there as you exit um, that if you would like an EV test drive in the future you can, you can sign up for that and Actera, uh, their EV ambassador program will coordinate with you and arrange for you to have a test drive in an EV vehicle. So I think that's pretty cool. So one last item uh, before I introduce our speakers. Who here wants to save money? Show of hands? Great. Pay attention to this. I'm, I'm really excited to announce that uh, Sunnyvale residents now have the opportunity to participate in a new home energy saving program. In partnership with Actera, who I just mentioned a moment ago on the EV um, ambassador program, they're also doing a, a program, sponsoring a program in conjunction with the city of Sunnyvale called Green at Home Program. It's a free program. It includes an online analysis of your PG&E smart meter data and provides you with a diagnosis of how your home is using energy. The program will email to you specific recommendations about your home, its energy use, and how you might save energy over time. And they'll send these reports to you on a bi-monthly basis. And if um, there's a need uh, and a desire on your part to have a consultant come out to your home, Tara will arrange that with you um, and give you a very specific hands-on uh, kind of energy audit for your house. This is a great way to save energy and to figure out and identify where you can be more efficient in your energy use at home. What's there to lose? It's a good idea. So I encourage you to sign up for that. Um, now, where uh, is uh, Patty Sexton? There she is. Patty's gonna hand out a, um, uh, a clipboard. If you would, are interested in this program and would like more information from Actera, sign up for this. I guess uh, provide your email um, and Actera will be in touch with you directly. 
There's also a, um, uh, an email site, uh, a website, uh, uh, an email address, Sunnyvale Green at Home, all one word, Sunnyvale Green at Home at ectera.org. So I encourage you to think about that. Okay. I want to introduce now our first speaker. We have two speakers, but one speaker is going to be here just for a couple of minutes, Don Bray. You've probably, if you've been to these um, lectures before, you've, you've heard Don talk before. Don is the manager of the account services at Silicon Valley Clean Energy, SVCE. And Don's going to remind us of what SVCE is all about and how it's benefiting Sunnyvale and the entire South Bay Peninsula. Um, and we'll provide a perfect lead-in for our, major, our main speaker for this evening. So, Don, I'd like to have you come up for a few minutes. All right, thank you, Steve, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as, as I uh, start my, uh, my warm-up act comments here, I'll try to keep it uh, brief, representing that's, uh, that's my role here. Um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy uh, is now officially launched and serving uh, energy customers uh, throughout 12 uh, cities here in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's, um, it's noteworthy that Sunnyvale played a huge role in getting this all started. Um, Sunnyvale working uh, very closely with the cities of uh, Cupertino, Mountain View, and the county of Santa Clara were really at the uh, at the, the focal point of, of getting this going, an additional uh, eight cities joined on. And, um, a year or two later, uh, here we are, uh, formed as uh, Silicon Valley Clean Energy. Uh, I'm going to give you, um, if I can make the slides work here, uh, just a quick overview of uh, what SVC is and what we aim to do. Uh, we source clean electricity, it's 100% carbon free electricity, uh, on behalf of uh, commercial and residential. Uh, electricity customers here in the valley. Uh, our goal, of course, uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, and we want to offer customers new choices. Um, and moving beyond that, we want to help uh, advance uh, electrification and decarbonization more broadly and beyond uh, the use of electricity. How does it work? Uh, well, in a, in a traditional utility environment, a um, investor-owned utility such as PG&E uh, sources electricity onto the grid and then gets that electricity to your business uh, or to your residence. So uh, they do um, uh, sourcing, transmission, and distribution. In a community choice energy model, that uh, sourcing portion is, is assumed by a new agency, uh, in our case, a community choice energy agency. Uh, so that's the role that SVCE plays. We buy electricity onto the grid and that's how we uh, are able to bring you 100% uh, carbon-free electricity, as that's our role. In terms of the organization, uh, SVCE, importantly, is a public joint powers uh, authority established by uh, 12 uh, local jurisdictions. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, the four uh, initiating members, Sunnyvale Mountain View, Cupertino, and the, the county, uh, then subsequently joined by Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, uh, Las Gatas, Saratoga, Monte Sereno, um, Campbell, um, Morgan Hill, and Gilroy. And I don't know if anyone was counting, but uh, <laughs> I think that's all 12. Uh, there is a, a board that's comprised of elected officials from each of those 12 communities. Uh, the board meets monthly. Uh, we actively invite your input at board meetings. Uh, they're posted. The agendas are posted. Um, join us and and. And tell us about your uh, your priorities and your ideas. There are other CCAs in California that have launched. In fact, over a million customers are now served by community choice energy agencies. Um, much of the Bay Area uh, is really at the center of that, but it's now extending up uh, the North Coast and uh, down into uh, Southern California as well. Um, most of you, hopefully all of you, uh, have received enrollment notices that look like this. Um, we had two primary enrollment periods, one in April and one in July, so you would have been enrolled in either of those periods. Um, it's an opt-out program, meaning you are automatically um, um, enrolled as a customer of SVCE unless you opt out. That's how the community choice rules work. 
uh, and you should get four of these notices, two before the enrollment and uh, two after. So if you're in the July enrollment, you may still get a couple more of these telling you that you're officially uh, on board. The two electricity choices, uh, Green Start is our uh, default product. Uh, as I mentioned, it's 100% carbon free, 50% sourced from hydro, and 50% sourced from qualifying renewables such as uh, wind and solar. Uh, you can also opt up and pay uh, just a little bit more, eight tenths of a cent more, and have 100% qualified renewables, so uh, wind and solar uh, power and other uh, renewables. I should mention Green Start is a little less expensive, actually, than PG&E. You save about 1% uh, uh, on your generation cost. So hard not to like this deal. Uh, it's 100% carbon-free electricity at uh, lower cost than, than PG&E. Your energy bill still comes from PG&E. Your um, generation line items will reference Silicon Valley Clean Energy. So you'll see SVCD on the bill, but otherwise it, it looks and feels a lot uh, like it has in the past. Uh, residential rate comparisons, you're know, moving quickly here, but you save about a tenth of a cent per kilowatt hour with Green Start versus PG&E's rate. Um, the average customer, that means somewhere between 50 cents and a dollar a month. Uh, don't spend it all at once, but it is, uh, it is a, a savings, and more importantly, you're getting uh, the, the best possible product. I mentioned the phasing earlier, uh, our two enrollment phases, April and July. As of uh, the start of August, we're now through uh, enrolling uh, 250,000 customers across those uh, 12 jurisdictions I mentioned. And that's uh, about uh, 660 megawatts um, peak power, if any of you like speeds and feeds, uh, and about four terawatt hours a year. So use those uh, factoids the next time you uh, need to dazzle people with the conversation. Um, if you're a NEM customer, any solar customers in the house? Okay. Um, so solar customers are enrolled on a separate schedule depending on your true update. Um, it's a lot of fine print there, but uh, um, we are, we've enrolled half of our NEM customers uh, so far, and if your true update is in August, September, or October, we'll enroll you in October. and. Finally, if it's in November, December, or January, we'll enroll you in January of, of 2018. And that's just to mitigate any issue with, uh, with how your, your true up works and making sure that we kind of balance you out as we bring you on to, uh, to SVCE. Uh, I'll leave it with these uh, final two slides. Um, this is an important chart. This shows what contributes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Silicon Valley. And I don't know if you can read the, the fine print or not, but that big piece of the pie, the big blue piece, 43%, is from transportation. So that's the direct tie-in to the, the rest of uh, this evening's conversation. Uh, the single biggest opportunity, the most important opportunity we have as a community to reduce GHGs is to get out there and shift away from fossil fuels for transportation uh, towards, uh, towards clean electricity. Um, to, to reference what SVC has accomplished, that green wedge on the bottom is uh, the 14% of emissions from commercial and industrial, industrial electricity use. And then that 7% dark blue one on the left, that's uh, residential electricity use. You put those together, that's 21% of the pie. Uh, we've taken that largely to zero with SVC. So we've reduced 20% of uh, our area's emissions through this. So it's kudos to the, the communities that help put this together. It's a really big move, and it's positioned us really well to, to start to uh, attack the other pieces of the pie as well. So in summary, uh, new options for clean energy at uh, very competitive rates. Uh, we're helping um, our communities take a big and, and very bold step in reducing uh, overall emissions. Uh, and we're a locally governed agency that's, that's bringing money back to the community to invest further in uh, electrification and decarbonization programs. With that, I'll take a quick question or two, and then uh, we get on to the, uh, the main event. Yes?
so we are procuring, um, you know, which, which we now have to do because we've got that, that piece of the responsibility. We are procuring half of the power that we provide from uh, hydro and, and half from renewable sources such as wind and solar. So we're doing that today. Um, yeah, so that answers your question. Do you know when you'll have it all in place financially so that we are receiving the 100% renewable energy? So you, you, can, you can buy that today if you want. You can buy that with the green prime product. You'll pay a little bit more for it. In terms of, of how the, the product composition might change over time, will, will our green start product, the product that... Uh, that most people buy become more and more renewable. I assume it will. Um, that's a decision that the board will make um, over the next uh, year or two, exactly what that, that roadmap looks like. But right now, it's at 50% renewable. That's better than PG&E. That's, uh, that's what it, it's mandated to be in the state of California in 2030. So we're way ahead of schedule. Um, oh, oh, so it is actually, so if you're on the Green Start program, you are actually really getting renewable energy. It's not and, just building and, the capital yes, for and, it. and it's carbon free uh, okay, today. Thank you. Know, you. So you're, you're doing great. Yeah. Okay, how about over here? I don't want to, I don't want to. Uh, One last question. Yes. <laughs> okay, right here. Is this a, t a trial program of some sort that in two years you'll evaluate it and then we go back to pg e if it's a failure? If the board makes bad decisions or something like that? No, this is not a trial program. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, there, there's uh, there's probably some NASA line for that. You know, um, yeah, this is this is the real. Yeah, failure is not an option. <laughs> it's funny how the mind works. Yeah, I knew there was. Yeah. Anyway, um, one thing I'd like to say before I leave: um, Pam Leonard is with us. Can I introduce Pam in the back? Uh, Pam's terrific. She is our manager of marketing, and she's going to be here throughout the meeting and at the end if you have questions. Um, and she also has good things to give away. Um, I don't know what's in that green bag, but uh, yeah, make sure you take some uh, SBC swag before you leave. Okay, thank you all very much. <laughs>
who will discuss how our daily commutes and traffic woes can be transformed by new transportation alternatives, including the electrification of Caltrain, the California High Speed Rail, and electric cars and buses. Let me share with you some highlights from um, Rod's a very distinguished career. Mr. Deridon is the Emeritus Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute and formerly its Executive Director from 1993 to 2014. The Mineta Transportation Institute is a transportation pol policy research center created by Congress in 1991. Mr. Deridon is known as the father of modern service, transportation service in Silicon Valley and has chaired more than 100 international, national, state, and local programs related to transit and the environment. Mr. Deridon was appointed in 2001 and then again in 2005 by Governors Davis and then Schwarzenegger to the California High Speed Rail Authority Board, of which he is Chair Emeritus. He helped found and is Chair Emeritus of the American Public Transportation Association's High Speed Intercity Rail Committee and National High Speed Rail Corridors Coalition. He served as the president of the National Council of University Transportation Centers and is the elected chair of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association's board. In 1996, he founded and chaired the Transportation Research Board study panel entitled Combating Global Warming Through Sustainable Transportation Policy. He advised the Federal Transit Administration and in 1995 chaired the National Research Council's Transportation Research Board's Transit Oversight and Projection Selection Committee. He provided keynotes, especially for high-speed rail and sustainability, in more than 50 U.S. cities and for a dozen international conferences and has published numerous related articles. He's driven electric cars since 1996, so he's, he, he talks his walk. And he walks his talk. <laughs> his home um, he has a photovoltaic array that is a net contributor to the grid. And since 1995, he's chaired the region's League of Conservation Voter, Voters Board and is a life member of the Sierra Club. Please join me in giving Mr. Deridon, our, our tonight's speaker, a, a, a warm welcome to Sunnyvale. This mic works, so uh, I will get near this mic or we'll get some feedback. Uh, and um, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Don, you did a great job. Uh, did he leave? Uh, okay, tell him he did a great job. And um, uh, that's the future, uh, electric energy. How many of you believe that climate change is real and being created by humankind. Please raise your hand. Uh, you know, I speak to, um, I speak frequently, and uh, there are some groups where less than half of the hands go up, still in California, in Silicon Valley. Uh, there is one fellow back on the East Coast now whose hand would not go up. And that's a tragedy. How, <laughs> how many of you have children or grandchildren? Well, me too. And I fear for their future. And that's why I'm here. I'm bumping up against 80 years old. I'm retired and have a wonderful wife and I ought to be home with her. <laughs> but I'm not. And I'm here with you because of those grandchildren. Uh, I read every issue of the National Geographic magazine, cover to cover. Have done that since I was a, a kid in grammar school. And that magazine, I think, is the best, most honest depiction of what's happening in the world in terms of science. And it is full of concern, especially the latest issue, 
for climate change. The descriptions of what will happen if we don't turn this around quickly, and by that I mean 10, 20 years from now, it may be too late. What will happen is ugly. It isn't just getting uncomfortably warm like it was today. It's uninhabitably warm. Oh, the cockroaches are going to love it. Oh, they love the heat and so on. They'll thrive with the heat. But people that look like you and me are going to die out. That's why I titled this somewhat provocatively, The Sixth Mass Extinction, with a question mark still. Well, while that question mark is up there, you and I have to do all we can possibly do to make sure that the predictions of our science do not come true. Now, what I'm not, I'd like to do is run through, and by the way, <clears throat> I lost the vocal cord in an operation a few years ago, so I have to croak at you like the godfather. And I apologize. I am Italian. I don't, don't let me kiss you. You know what happens when the godfather kisses you. The, uh, what I'd like to do, and I'm, we're honored to have uh, the uh, past mayor of Cupertino here, Rod Sinks. We we're honored to have the, the uh, vice mayor council member uh, from, uh, from, San Jose, from Sunnyvale here, uh, Larry Klein. Oh, another one. We, we have <laughs> that rascal was, was chosen the environmentalist of the year two years ago by the League of Conservation Voters. Jim, nice to have you here. Thank you. So you have, you have a good pedigree here in Sunnyvale. Uh, let me let me describe when you, when you give a speech you tell them what you're gonna tell them you tell them and then you tell them what you told them and what I'd like to go through with you now is a description of the climate change is occurring what's causing it and what can be done to fix it and I'm going to do that in a, just a few minutes then we're going to look at examples of what you can do to fix it and then we're going to talk about some local examples. And then we're going to let you tell me where I'm wrong or reinforce what I've said as you choose. So let's, let's get into this. That information is why we are in hot water, pardon the pun. Uh, in California, but also in the other Sun Belt areas of the United States. California, Silicon Valley is the epicenter because we have the jobs. We're, we're high tech. People are coming here from around the world to work at our high tech opportunities. And so we're growing faster than anywhere else in the state. And the state is growing faster than anywhere else in the nation. But what that comes down to is from the State Department of Finance, they've always underestimated growth. So this is probably a minimum. 25 million more people here by shortly after mid-century. That's like dropping the state of New York into California. Now, fortunately, we don't have to take the New Yorkers, <laughs> but it's still a lot of people. And we would not recognize our state as the place that we love if we do it the same way we've done it in the past. If we do it with urban sprawl, putting more people on highways, you and I will want to leave, as will our children. I get to talk. OK, so we're growing rapidly. Now, that graph was above the fold on the right-hand side of the front page of the New York Times newspaper. I think the New York Times is probably one of the last truly peer-reviewed newspapers that comes out each day. 
maybe the Washington Post is another. Uh, and I read it every morning. You ought to do that too. It has good information in it. What that says is that, you see where the little red arrow is up there on the right hand side? That's where the CO2 load in the atmosphere is right now. And it's measured in uh, uh, parts per million uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. Now, this study is agreed to by four different countries. Those four countries can't agree on the time of day. They hate each other, but they agree on this data. China, the US, and so on. And what it says is that at that time, three years ago, no, in 2013, five years ago now, we were twice as high in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere as ever in the last 800,000 years. This is according to ice corings in the Antarctic and sediment corings in the Pacific. Twice as high as ever in 800,000 years. And four times as high as the average in that period of time. Well, if that doesn't scare you, then nothing's going to scare you. If you are not worried for those babies that we just raised our hands about, then nothing's ever going to worry you. It scares me. Because that isn't a trend. That's a spike going straight up, and it's still going straight up, becoming worse and worse. This is saying it the same way, only this is actual temperature measurements. And what it says <clears throat> is that the hottest three years in the recorded history of the Earth are the last three years. You think that's coincidence? No. It's a trend. And that trend, those red lines marching up off the right-hand side of that page, is what's happening. And this year is going to set a new record. It just validates the CO2 load data on the prior page. OK, we know that climate change is occurring. We know that it's uh, caused by CO2. We know CO2 is out of control. And it's causing heat to be out of control as a measurement around the world. Well, what's causing it? This is a study by a group of Nobel laureates at Stanford. It was led by Stanford, actually. They're from all over the, maybe, uh, maybe NASA was involved in that, too. And it says that 38% of that CO2 is coming from transportation nationwide. But in California, it's nearer 50% because of our addiction to the automobile. Now, industry is 20%. It's a tiny fraction. It's 50% 50, 50 of, of, of what we can control in transportation. And we can't do much about industry. Energy, compliments to the uh, uh, local choice energy. Uh, we're doing something about that, and so on. But the real culprit that we can do something about is transportation. Well, we know it's out of control. We know it's caused by transportation. What's causing it? What kind of transportation? This is done by Dr. Anthony Pearl. Uh, Anthony Pearl is one of the fine researchers in the world on the subject. And uh, he indicates and it's been confirmed by the National Research Council that cars are the culprit. Automobiles, petroleum-powered automobiles are the culprit. You can see that they create just under 200 parts, grams uh, of CO2 per seat mile. That's the measure of, of efficiency, uh, climate change efficiency of, of a transportation device. So a five-passenger uh, vehicle would have five seat miles, and this is the kind of pollution you get on that car. Now, air travel is just as bad 
if you take only short hop airlines, and that's what we're focusing on with high speed rail, by the way. Short hop airlines are as bad on a seat mile basis as an automobile. When you put them all together, then they're they're a little bit better. But air travel is very much a culprit. Buses, diesel powered buses are terrible. That's why you see Valley Transportation Authority testing electrically powered buses now and hybrid buses and moving away from the old diesel powered buses. LR, now, then you get to the remedies. Steel wheel on rail is the least friction in, in inhibited transportation device. And when you have that steel wheel on rail run by electricity, then you have light rail, high speed rail, metro rail like BART, commuter rail like Caltrain will be when it's electrified. That's the solution. That's, that's where we're going to fix it. Now that, that um, amount of, of uh, pollution per seat mile is assuming that you're not getting your electricity uh, from renewable sources. Once we have uh, all renewable sources, then the, the, the uh, pollution goes away. And we get to where we need to go if we're going to protect those kids. So we have a recognition that, high, that uh, the global warming is out of control. We have a recognition that it's caused by transportation, at least the part we can fix. We have a recognition that you fix it with electrically powered transportation systems, preferably steel wheel on rail, which are the most efficient known to humankind. Let's look at what the rest of the world is doing in regard to fixing things. 18 nations right now have operating high-speed rail systems. Another 18 are planning or building high-speed rail systems. There's only one that doesn't. Uh, do you know which one that is? <laughs> Donald Trump's very happy about that. There's Japan. I'm going to run through these quickly, so you're going to have to listen quickly. Larry, if you have to go, Thank you for sticking. Um, Japan is one of those. Uh, let me, this is a, a kind of a archetypical example of the success. Japan began high speed rail in the 1950s, 1954. They've operated since that time. They began at 135 miles an hour. They're now going 220 miles an hour. They have never had a fatality. They've carried billions and billions of riders with not one fatality. That's, fat, that's safer than walking on a sidewalk. And they have broken that system. The, the nation built it. They broke the system down into four segments. They franchised out those four segments to private companies. The private companies now operate those four segments. They're, they're traded on the stock market. They're making a profit, and they're paying the country of Japan for the right to use the system. So they're getting a franchise fee that's helping to amortize the debt. That's not brain surgery. Why can't we do that? Well, we can. There's their 220 mile an hour Shinkansen, high speed, happy wind is what that means. Uh, high-speed train. There's the Korean high-speed system, uh, rapidly expanding, outstanding. There's the Korean high-speed train. There's the Taiwanese uh, high-speed train. Now, Taiwan tried to do it on the cheap, and they built their stations in the farmlands. Well, they found out that cows don't ride high-speed rail. <laughs> And as a consequence, they're one of the only high-speed rail systems in the world that requires a subsidy to operate. And, and they're gradually filling in around the stations, and it's, it's responding much better. But, but uh, 
And it's an outstanding system, by the way. That's their 200 mile an hour train. China, the 900 pound gorilla when it comes to high speed technology, and in fact, when it comes to sustainable technology, China is beating our behinds. I'll tell you, they're, they're trying very, very hard to be sustainable. And they're making us look pretty, pretty sad in the process. They're converting all of their rail systems, 130,000 miles of rail, to electricity. Now, they're already at over 10,000 kilometers on the East Coast, connecting their major cities with a 230 mile per hour high speed rail system. 10,000 kilometers. They've only been building high speed rail for 20 years. 20 years. And they have 10,000 kilometers in operation, and they have another 8,000 miles of the rest of it being converted to 130 mile an hour for freight and passenger. Alan Greenspan, a few years ago, well, 40 years ago now, said very clearly, and I believe it, that the country that gets people to work and product to the market most efficiently wins the geoeconomic competition. No question. That's, that's the measure. China is winning the geoeconomic competition. They're leaving us in the dust. And the primary reason is because of their transportation system and their conversion of their transportation system to electric power. That's their 230 mile an hour high speed train. That's the European system. Now that's their 2025 master plan, but it's virtually all built. They're way ahead of schedule on that. Now look at little Spain down there. Spain's a poor country. Their banks were ready to fail. They had high unemployment. But they've got 5,000 kilometers of high-speed rail because it's good for business. There's the French advanced high-speed train, 200 mile an hour. There's the German high-speed train. Lower right-hand corner is the 200 mile an hour. I'm Italian. That's the Italian high-speed train. I got to ride the first train with President Berlusconi from uh, uh, Rome to Milan about five years ago. When they uh, about uh, ten years ago now, time passes. And l let me tell you, you've heard about his bunga bunga parties. Well, <laughs> there were some a lot of young women on that train for some reason. <laughs> We got there, and we got there fast, and it was fun. And I got to ride through some of the tunnels in the cab. And they franchised it out like the Japanese are, and the chair of the board of the franchising company is the president of Ferrari. And guess what he did when he, when he bought it, when he took over the company, the franchise? He painted them red. They go faster red. There's the Spanish train, the lower right-hand corner is the 200 mile an hour train. That's Turkey's train. I'm not doing something right here. Uh, well, let's go back one. That's the Russian high-speed train. Why is it that Russia can have a high-speed train and the US can't have a high-speed train? They're way behind us technologically. This, is, this isn't just ridiculous, it makes me mad. We've got, we, we're way ahead of them in terms of the ability to do technology. But Russia's gonna have a high-speed train before the United States has. Hooray for Putin. Well, there's the US map. The only problem is that there's nothing built. The blue lines are the 130 mile an hour, 120, 130 mile an hour uh, uh, system. And it's, it's uh, designed for both freight and passenger. The green lines, the northeast corridor, and the uh, Texas 
that triangle of the Texas T-bone, the Florida system, the Kansas City to Chicago, and the California Green Line system are the ones that are supposed to be 200 mile an hour systems. The problem is that none of them are built. The, the cellar corridor between Washington and Boston is there. It averages 81 miles an hour, gets up to 150 miles an hour for 30 miles. And uh, they have the desire to, to do it, but they don't have the funding. And they don't have the cooperation of this administration by any means. Okay, there's the California system. Now the blue line, the solid blue line, is all under construction. About $6 billion worth of contracts have been signed to build that up to and including the rail. The next portion will be the dotted blue line from the north end of the solid blue line through a little place called Chowchilla, which will be the Y, W-Y-E, where the train will diverge to the west, go under the Pacheco Pass, in tunnels, uh, one of the tunnels will be about 15, 16 miles long, and come out at Gilroy, and at Gilroy turn north along the Monterey Highway, the Union Pacific right-of-way, through San Jose, whatever that station is called, <laughs> and, and, then, and then on up to San Francisco. Now the right-of-way between San Jose and San Francisco is there. They're going to use the Caltrain right-of-way, the Caltrain tracks, and the Caltrain electrification, which the High Speed Rail Authority is paying part of the cost of, the groundbreaking of which occurred two weeks ago. So it's going to be prepared, ready to go, and all they need is electrically powered trains to be on those tracks. Now that portion from uh, Bakersfield to San Francisco is supposed to be in full operation by late 2025. That's eight years from now, a little less than eight years from now. I don't think they're going to make it, but they're not going to miss it by much. 2026, maybe. And they're working very hard to make it happen. And our wonderful uh, governor, who I'm so proud of for all he's doing in terms of the environment, uh, is going to make sure that it happens quickly because he wants to write it. And he, and he and I are within a month of being the same age. And he, in a speech recently, he said that he was eating his uh, green vegetables, lifting his weights, because he wanted to be there to honk the horn on the first high-speed train. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm with him. We're going to be together doing that. So there's the system. Now, let's look at it from a different perspective. Animations are wonderful, aren't they? Okay, we're going to leave Union Station in LA, which will become the largest station outside of New York. The, um, that's, that's the station in Anaheim, which is already built, by the way. Go up through LA, Burbank, heading north. Palmdale, the high desert, down from the high desert to Bakersfield, up through the Central Valley. Riding a high-speed train is very comfortable, by the way. You can walk around. There's no feeling of motion. Up through the Central Valley, flat, straight. And through the Pacheco area in tunnels, Gilroy. That's the way it might look. Infill is planned. Google is going to make that look a lot different, and that infill is going to be a lot bigger. But right on up to the history terminal in San Francisco. And look at the infill that's going to occur there. And 
the southern portion from San Diego, uh, uh, yeah, San Diego out of the uh, Lindbergh Field, up uh, through the uh, Inland Empire, Riverside, Ontario, the airport, and into downtown LA. And then we'll talk about the connection to look at the infill in in, uh, in Fresno. That's a two billion dollars of privately uh, funded tax base in Fresno, up to the uh, flat Central Valley, looping around and into the old Southern Pacific Railroad yards, uh, which are going to become a grand station in our state capital. That's what it's going to look like. And it's being built now. And the funding for the portion from Bakersfield to San Francisco is funded. Thanks to the approval of the cap and trade funds, which was reaffirmed by the legislature two, two weeks ago, that's fully funded from Bakersfield to San Francisco. They're going to have to work on the portion from Bakersfield south to LA, which is a complicated construction project because a lot of it's going to be in tunnel. Now let's let's uh, go from that micro look, macro look to look at what you can do on a micro fashion to make it work like a system. Remember, high speed rail by itself is useless. In fact, it's it's a detriment because it'll overload your downtowns unless you make it into a system. So let's look at the system. This is our valley. This is our our Bay Area, our region. Uh, there, the yellow lines are the, uh, the commuter rail systems, Caltrain, the Capital Train to Sacramento, and the Altamont Express out to Stockton. Those are there now, they're in operation, but they will quadruple in terms of the ridership in the future. And then we see BART as it was when it was started back in the late 60s and early 70s. And then we see what's being constructed right now. That's being built. That's funded and being built to through San Jose and up to Santa Clara in a maintenance facility in the area that used to be called FM's Food Machinery Corporation uh, there. That um, the portion from Berryessa through downtown San Jose isn't quite funded. So they're still going to have to fight for a couple of hundred about almost a billion dollars, uh, which is about a third of the funding for that. It's almost all in tunnel through the downtown area of San Jose. Uh, light rail, there's what we began with, the Guadalupe Corridor light rail project and the Tasman Corridor project. <coughs> that was built in the last uh, couple of decades. That's uh, Tasman East and the Capital Corridor and the Vasona Corridor. And that's what is going to be built now in the next uh, uh, decade. Uh, downtown east, probably along Stevens Creek, and the uh, uh, southeast portion of the commute loop. Our master plan has us built like Stuttgart, Germany, or Toronto, Canada, where you have a commute loop around the perimeter and then spokes in and out of the loop. So you, you don't go downtown. You don't go through downtown with every train. You go in the, in the loop around the perimeter until you get to your spoke, and then you take the spoke to where you want to go. And that's the most efficient form of transportation. It's Paris. Paris is bigger, of course. OK, and the buses. Buses will be all over the place. Uh, by the way, I, I should mention that Rod Sink, uh, Council Member Sink from from uh, uh, Cupertino has led an effort at getting us the west side corridor for that commute loop studied. And hopefully, they'll be able to get that built so you'll have the, the west side portion of the loop done. And I see uh, Larry nodding uh, in the back, so Sunnyvale's on board. Okay. 
Uh, buses all over the place. I, we don't put the routes down there because they're going to be changing and because they, they cover everything. But the buses will be pulled back from through routes as, as light rail and uh, busways take over some of the through routes and the buses will be primarily used to circulate in the communities, go back to the stations, and that's called the feeder and distribution system. High-speed rail then goes right through the middle of it, and it becomes the, the longer uh, distant carrier. Think of what that is going to do for the San Jose Airport. People that are going to be taking long trips that live in the Central Valley will, and this, this is how it works in Germany, by the way, where Lufthansa runs the high-speed rail system. They get on the high-speed train in Fresno, they check their bag to Paris. They don't touch that bag again. They, they take the high-speed train, put their feet up, have a cocktail, gets a nap, whatever. They get off 51 minutes later. Right now, that takes three hours to drive from Fresno to San Jose. In San Jose, they take the people mover over to the airport. Don't touch the bags. Get on their plane. It takes them right to the gate. They get on the they get on the plane, go to Paris, get off the the, uh, the airplane, grab their bags, go through customs, and that's the way we ought to be traveling. But we don't in America. They do in the other countries, but we don't in America because the petroleum lobby is so powerful. Okay, we've got the San Jose station and the San Jose airport. Uh, I, I have to chuckle a little bit here. Normanette is a dear friend. We served the same district for 20 years together. And of course, he's named the name of the uh, airport's named after him. We have a little argument going. Is it better to have a train station named after you or an airport? <laughs> and we'll, he and I will never agree on that argument. But there's a very awkward 1.2 miles between the airport and the train station. Well, the people can't walk it. What's going to happen there? That's what's going to happen. Now, it probably won't be that route, because San Jose has already found a better route. This was a preliminary study. But they're going to create what's called an automated guideway transit system, AGT. <coughs> it looks like. A ski lift. Only instead of being on a bouncy cable, you're on a your your pods are hanging from a, a strong steel support, and you zoom along in your pod. It might have, might be four or five people, it might be as many as ten people, depending on the pod. You when you get on at the say the Deardon station, you walk across the platform, get in your pod. You put, you put the code in, I want to go to Southwest Airline uh, Terminal. The pod then, if you're by yourself, zooms along, skips the other stops, and takes you to Southwest Airlines. Stops, you get off, and you're at the airline. Pretty civilized. Uh, and that, uh, it, it's all in a secured setting. so. You, you're, once, you're, once you're cleared, you're cleared. That's in the planning process. We're trying to act like a great community in the world, like Silicon Valley ought to. But there's not the funding. And we have some institutional issues, which I'm happy to respond to in terms of questions. OK. Now, in terms of that feeder distribution system, we have already a network uh, down in the Santa Cruz area. There's a rail system down there that has been used for cement trains, great big heavies, so this good, strong steel uh, rail system that we could be using right now. We could start Caltrain in Davenport and have Caltrain coming down through Santa Cruz Capitola, 
Watsonville, up through Gilroy, right on up through San Jose and to San Francisco in the morning. And you add then all of Santa Cruz and Monterey County, by the way, is, is the same way, into the Caltrain or the Capital Train or whatever one of those systems you want to use. There's no reason in the world we can't be doing that. It would cost maybe a hundred million dollars, a couple hundred million dollars to make sure that you've got the signalization proper and that you've got the stations set up and parking and, and, uh, and so on. But what an advantage it is to have those rails already sitting there and, and that kind of a feeder distribution network all set for your commuter shed so that people can stop killing themselves coming over Highway 17 in the mornings and killing our, our planet with the, with the pollution. Well, the other side of this is land use. And in Sunnyvale and more suburban cities, this is a tough one. Well, let me lay it out for you and ask you to become acolytes in this because it has to be done. When we build these systems, we put hundreds of billions of dollars into building these transportation systems. We have to densify with high density development on top of those stations. Remember, we're going to have 25 million more people in this state in the next 30, 40, 50 years. You, you can't do that and sprawl them out on the perimeter like we have been in the past. We'll have no more watershed, no more view shed, no more farmlands. We've got to stack them up. Like, you, you're travelers. When you travel through France, France, by the way, is about the same land area as California, but they have over twice the amount of population that we have. Yet when you travel through France, you're looking out at green most of the time. You come to a, a community and it's it, it, it's it's higher rise community, and then you're back out in the farmlands. That's because they don't let you build in the farmlands. If you want to build in France, you either build on something that's already built, or you build on top of a train station and the parking. In France, they call it transit villages. We're beginning to call it that here now. And the way, the idea to do, the way to do it here, because we're starting from scratch, so to speak, is to put a podium over the top of the parking, the rail line, and the open space adjacent, the station, and a, a big cement podium all of the dirty stuff is under the podium. Parking, your cars, uh, and stuff like that, under the podium. The rail line and the station are under the podium. On top of the podium is grass. Uh, and out of that grass, then, are juxtaposed. See, they're not right next to each other, but separated so everybody has sight lines. High-rise condominiums, rental, and some commercial development. By doing that, and doing it only over the top of the, of, the, of the stations, we can accommodate that growth. And we can accommodate with some more affordable housing, aided housing, because developers can, can provide you the aided housing if they have enough density. But the way we build now, we never give them enough density to be able to provide subsidized housing. and we make the neighborhoods angry because we wind up pushing it out into the neighborhoods. If we only do it on top of our rail stations and on top of our parking, and you do it in high, high density, high, high uh, altitude, many, many stories, and keep it only over those stations, then we don't cause inconvenience for the neighborhoods. We don't want the density in the neighborhood. That just puts more cars on the roadway system. We want those people force-fed into mass transportation. And you do that by building it on top of your train stations. 
If we do that, we already have 62 train stations in Santa Clara County. Light rail, commuter rail, and BART stations now in Santa Clara County. 62 of them. About two-thirds of them have big parking lots and are conducive to this kind of development. We're trying to persuade VTA now to go ahead with Transit Village uh, bids for the air rights for developers to build transit villages above those stations and the parking. The problem we're having is that the general population doesn't understand that we're just talking about building on top of the, the stations, not general density. Let me, let me tell you something about our roads. They are never going to become uncongested. The roads in Silicon Valley are going to be only more and more congested because we're growing so rapidly in terms of jobs and people that they are just going to become more and more congested. Our only way of protecting our job base and maintaining a livable community is to do this kind of development. Force feeding people into the mass transportation system, avoiding putting more people into our highways and making sure that that transit system is sustainable and electrically powered. Uh, let me get off my soapbox and uh, oftentimes the questions will relate to the map. So let's go back to the map. And now I would love to answer your questions. We've got about 20 minutes. And uh, so think of good questions. Stop. How long do you think it would take to get from San Jose to San Francisco? How long from San Jose to LA? You just give me some time so we can compare with you know airline or the existing train system. I guess we're back on. The high-speed rail uh, timetable schedule between San Jose and San Francisco is a little under 30 minutes. Now, it could go faster than that, but uh, they're going to go more slowly <coughs> on the peninsula because it's so crowded and because when you get up to 200 miles an hour, there is air noise uh, with a high-speed train. They're working on that, but it's still pretty noisy. So they, they're going 130, 140 miles an hour on the peninsula. At that speed, there's no noise, and there's no pollution. Uh, so it should be comfortable for the people along the way, and it's just a little under 30 minutes. From San Jose to LA is two hours and one minute. And I take that trip quite a bit to go down there and do business, and it takes me about four and a half hours, best situation to get from arriving at the airport to getting into downtown LA, where your business is and where your interchanges are. Uh, an hour uh, for security time at the airport, then you fly down there, it's an hour, a little over an hour to fly down if everything works, and then you kind of get to the hassle of LAX and uh, find a cab or, or a shuttle or whatever is going to take you downtown LA, that's another hour, 45 minutes to an hour, and another 70 bucks, by the way. And uh, uh, so two hours and one minute to Union Station in downtown LA, or four and a half hours by air travel to downtown LA. And uh, the price can be a fraction of the airline ticket, or it can be as much as a full airline ticket. And as a full airline ticket, the people will still use the train because it's a better, it's a better trip. Um, 
And with a full airline ticket, the system will be carrying about 41 million riders a year and be very profitable at that many riders a year. So the franchise, franchise uh, is a possibility. It, I apologize for the coughing. No. That one work? That sounds better. So uh, none of these systems were designed for a world of self-driving cars, and yet none of them are going to be finished before we effectively have a good chunk of our cars out there self-driving. How does it all fit together? Uh, let me ask you to be cautious about self-driving cars. Not because they won't work. They absolutely will work. Uh, there's going to be an integration period, though. We've studied them uh, at the Minetti Institute. It's going to be brutal. Until everybody's driving a self-driving car, the self-driving car process won't work as efficiently as we want it to work. And it won't be as safe. You get these kids with a lot of testosterone and a great big pickup with the big wheels and the gun rack in the back and so on. And they're zooming in and out and your self-driving car is trying to uh, do what's safe and, and it gets pretty confused. And so it's, it, there's going to be an adjustment period. Now I, I really think that eventually self-driving, we're going to lose the ability to be so-called independent and in driving independently. And we're all going to be driving self-driving cars. At the same time, we're not going to be driving them very fast because our roadway systems will always be overcrowded, even with self-driving cars. We just have too many people. Now, I, I don't want to say that because I want my babies to have jobs in Silicon Valley. So good for Apple and good for Google and so on as they, as they create more and more jobs. But as you say that, you have to realize that the jobs are going to be there. People are going to come to the jobs. And as that happens, our roads will be overcrowded because we can't seriously expand our roadway system. We're out to the sound walls you know, with most of our roads. So we're not going to get much more capacity from our roads. So even if we're driving self-driving cars, and the best projections are that they're not going to be, we're not going to have the whole thing done in the next seven or eight years when high-speed rail is done. But even if we, we have a self-driving car system, it's still going to be overloaded. And so don't put all your, all your uh, uh, bets in that pocket. Uh, it's, it's one fix. It's one element of the fix. But it isn't the total fix. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you, uh, you know, I, I drive a, a, a Tesla Model S. Saw the red one out there. That's mine. That's mine and the bank's. <laughs> uh, and the bank owns most of it. Uh, the let, let, let me tell you a little cute story. My wife is uh, Dr. Gloria Duffy. She's the president of the Commonwealth Club, and she her, her life's work has been as a nuclear arms negotiator. She ran the Nung Luger program, negotiating the disarmament of the uh, Soviet satellite countries. Uh, and uh, you should never negotiate with a nuclear arms negotiator. <laughs> Last Christmas, she, she came to me and says, Honey, I'm going to buy you a Tesla. Well, she knows I love electric cars. And so I said, Whoopee, that's nice, honey. So we went up to the Tesla factory and we picked up this darling little red car. And I was driving it back way too fast. It, it, it has a tendency to do that. I, it's not my fault. <laughs> And, and as we were coming back, she says, oh, by the way, you're paying half. <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. And I, I, I hope Elon is accurate uh, when he says that the, uh, the people have been calling it the boob tube, but it's not that. It's a hyperloop. Uh, uh, can work. 
he has to prove it though and he hasn't yet he has a prototype that's got a 150 mile an hour uh, and it it hasn't gone around a turn yet it hasn't gone up or down yet uh, it is under very controlled circumstances um, we the high speed rail authority when he came out with the idea originally <coughs> had three MIT professors study it and they came back to us with, with a paper and said indeed it, it will work you can get people from the west coast to the east coast in something like, like an hour a uh, couple of hours uh, but when they get there they'll be dead <laughs> <laughs> the, the, uh, the way it's, it's currently set up the g-forces uh, are just horrendous and and also the inability to to uh, to uh, accelerate effectively uh, and decelerate effectively uh, causes some some problems but the primary difficulty is going around turns and you can't build it exactly straight between here and New York it just can't be done uh, so he's gonna have to prove that he can do it I hope he can, but you know it wouldn't take the place of our high-speed train in California. Give this thought: you're talking about a system that will go 700 miles an hour, and it's 300 miles between here and LA. You're not going to use a 700 mile an hour system to go 300 miles. You're not even going to get it up to speed. So, so the use of Elon's system would be to replace the transcontinental airline system. And God bless him, I hope he can do it. But it will be horrendously expensive to build. And in earthquake country, it might have some other challenges. But let's hope he can do it. And if he can prove that he can do it, then by golly, I think everybody will wanna, wanna buy one. Maybe with my next month's allowance. <laughs> yes, sir. So can you um, sort of in the in the flair of uh, presenting Japan and, and all the other high-speed rail systems, can you explain the tension behind what it really means to be high-speed sure. um, in in California or in the USA, and what you think the turning point may be? Is it just going to be a population thing, or is it going to be a technological light bulb that goes off um, with the regular others back in D.C.? Um, let me describe, first of all, what high speed is. In the world's vernacular, high speed is over 300 kilometers per hour. That's 187 miles an hour. So anything over 187 miles an hour is considered internationally to be high speed. Uh, some areas fudge it a little bit. Russia fudges it a little bit, and, and, and so do the Greeks. But uh, that's, that's, the, that's the general measure. Now, what what will happen in California? Let, let's talk about really what's holding us back. It isn't technology. It's old technology now. The Japanese have been doing it since 50, 1954. It's politics, purely and simply. If you begin running high-speed trains, on steel wheel on rail, electrically powered, then you put out of business your short, short hop airlines. Short hop airlines are run by petroleum. Not a little bit, but vast, vast quantities of petroleum. And so you have the petroleum industry fighting high speed rail in America, tooth and nail, which is fine, which, which is the reason why you have one party, political party, that is primarily funded by, by the petroleum interests much more opposed than any other political party. And I'm not going to use names, but uh, I, I think you can reason through that. And that's, that's, those are the facts of life. And it's, it is irrefutable. Uh, I think what's going to happen is that people are going to recognize when California's system goes into operation that is so obviously the better choice especially now that climate change has become such a serious issue, that if California does it, then you're going to see Texas do it. 
you're going to see probably the next one probably will be Florida and then Texas and the Northeast Corridor, which is nibbling away at it, and and then the Chicago Corridor. And, and then the dam will break and, and you'll see more and more and more of them. But it, it really, the, the, the blockage is not at all technological. It's financial, it costs a lot of money, but not nearly as much money as building more freeways. High-speed rail costs less than building freeways. Uh, and it, of course, doesn't pollute and it carries a lot more people. Yes, sir. Yes, um, I'm concerned about um, the grade separation issue. Caltrain's being electrified, but it's not going to be complete grade separation by any means. Yes. Now high speed rail is going to come in. Are you <clears throat> going to have to redo the electrification? No. The grade separation? No, they're, they're talking about grade separating uh, Caltrain all the way. In, uh, in part, in preparation for Caltrain, Caltrain, by the way, is going to be going 100 miles an hour in the future. So they're, they're going to have to be grade separated eventually. And, and the high speed train is going to have to be grade separated. And, and uh, so the intent is to eventually grade separate Caltrain everywhere. But once, once it's electrified and the towers are in, then the grade separation really becomes expensive, right? Uh, if you have to change the towers, but you technically really don't have to. Grade separations, uh, when you grade separate Caltrain, you're not going to change the train system. You're going to dip under the train system by the roadway system. So, so the grade separations are going to be the crossroads coming under the, the train system because you can't run a train step system up and down, especially if you're going 130 miles an hour. Uh, your, your tummies can't handle that. So, so the great separation will be the, the highways going under, and that isn't going to disrupt your electrical. Right here. Thank you, council member. There's a question right here. Okay, and then over here. here okay. Please. So I want to build on this point that we don't lack technology, we lack the political will, and what we as citizens can do to build that. So I'm part of a group called Mothers Out Front, and we help get community choice energy in oh, San Jose. Oh, I know. Yeah. And um, one thing I have, question I have is that these programs are generating revenue for the cities. What could the cities be doing, and how can we lobby them to use the funds in ways that could incentivize electrification of transportation? The, um, the first step in that direction was cap and trade. And although I don't love cap and trade because it doesn't make the corrections as fast as I'd like to see it, it, it to make uh, in terms of cleaning up the environment, it certainly creates a revenue source for for uh, cleaning up uh, other aspects. So that's a first step. Uh, cities can do similar things to ca as cap and trade to encourage their local polluting organizations to, uh, to, to uh, trade off their pollution for uh, a reduction in general pollution like the cap and trade system. So that's one alternative. It probably isn't going to happen because it's too complicated for each city to be doing. Uh, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District talked about doing that at one stage, and I don't know that they're they're continuing. Um, I think the best thing you can do is to elect good legislators, local city council members and members of your county board of supervisors. If you elect good people, they're not going to be folding to the uh, petroleum interests or, or polluting interests. They're going to be doing what you ask them to do. Uh, but you've got to be careful. You've got to, Larry's a good one. Uh, now, you, but you've got you to make sure 
uh, uh, rod sink is a good one, but you got to make sure you've got a good one there as you, as you do your support. One way of doing that is to watch for the uh, environmental organization's endorsements, the League of Conservation Voters, Sierra Club, and uh, or get involved yourself. You know, the uh, mothers for uh, 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 mothers, out. mothers out front endorse people. Give them a questionnaire. Let them let them fill out your questionnaire and see how they answer. And then endorse them if they answer it the right way. And make sure they sign the questionnaire. <laughs> so that later, when key issues come up that you asked about in the questionnaire, you can wave that in front of their face. Remember, you, you promised you signed a pledge. Yes, sir. One of your early slides was about uh, carbon dioxide per seat mile, I think was the That's right. unit. Um, how many seats in the train need to be filled in order to make that number? In other words, when I see a light rail train go by with only two or three people on it, how is that comparing to if those people yeah. were driving in a couple of cars, for example? Well, that, um, that depends on your trains to be full. And in other countries, your, your trains are full. Now, the reason why light rail is not filled in this county is because we've only got half a system. You saw the, the map up there when I did the click to. We don't have anything down the west side. Yet the west side is where the highest transit ridership is. And we don't have, we don't have anything in the west side. The second thing we haven't done with our light rail system is we haven't put anything near it. We haven't put the housing on top of those stations like other countries around the world have. You know, if you're in Toronto and you go up in a big building, you look across Toronto, it's a flat community. It's a one-story community, except where the train stations are. And then it looks like mushrooms on top of those train stations. You can see where the train stations are. But the general Toronto community is one story. That's what we would envision in Santa Clara County. A one story uh, county with mushrooms on top of our, what will ultimately be 150 or so train stations. If you do that, then your trains are gonna run full. If we don't, they're never gonna work. And we shouldn't be spending billions of dollars on mass transportation. So remember, it's two things transit and land use. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Do, do we have? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll come right to you. Wave it at me when you have the mic. Great, thank you. Uh, I've been following the High Speed Rail Project for a long time, and I, I've got a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, uh, number one is, why does it appear to duplicate the existing rail infrastructure in the LA area and the San Francisco area. It seems to duplicate what we're doing with BART and Caltrain up here and what LA is doing with Metrolink. And why do we punch a hole through Pacheco Pass instead of using the existing rail right-of-way through Altamont? Oh, I can answer those questions and there are some logical answers. First of all, it isn't duplicating, it's using those right-of-ways. Uh, it, uh, you're not running redundant trains, you're, you're running on those right-of-ways and therefore not having to build other right-of-ways, especially in the Caltrain area. Now, the, the uh, Altamont versus Pacheco issue has been one that's, <laughs> it, it's been a hot one all the way through the process. It's been studied three times now and each one of those has concluded that the better route for ridership by far and the least destructive route in terms of environmental is to have a tunnel under Pacheco Pass and to include that whole commuter shed uh, in the south part of Santa Clara County, San Mateo, or, or Monterey in Santa Cruz counties. Now, 
it isn't hard to figure this out when you when you just use a little logic. A high speed train system isn't going to be paid for in terms of the ridership revenue by people by the little grandmama taking her grandbabies to Disneyland. When you first think about it, that's that's what you think about. Oh, I can take the kids to Disneyland. Well, that's going to be a very rare trip. The trip that's going to pay for the high-speed rail system is the commuter coming in from Fresno every morning. We have about 60 to 70,000 of those every morning. Right now, coming in on Highway 152 and 580, driving three hours a direction, burning $4, $3 a gallon gasoline on very dangerous roadway systems. Virtually all of those people are going to shift to the high-speed train. And their tickets are going to be subsidized by industry. We've already know from the Silicon Valley Leadership Group that most of their members are ready to subsidize the tickets. So it becomes a win-win-win-win. So if you realize that the market is a Silicon Valley employee coming out of the Central Valley, and that the major concentration of homes in the Central Valley is Merced, Modesto Merced, down to South of Fresno. And you want to get them to Silicon Valley, then you don't want to take them up through Stockton and down the Altamont train system. That's a big fish hook way, going way up around. Besides that, the route through the uh, Altamont Pass is a son of a gun. It isn't, it isn't an easy one where we can go a, a big tunnel through what is good consolidated earth under the Pacheco. It is hashed up. It has several earthquake faults. And the cities along the way don't want it. They don't want you putting something through their communities because you can't stop. Remember, it's high-speed rail. You stop at every little town, it's not high-speed rail anymore. And so Livermore, Pleasanton, so on, are, are going to have the train going through their town, but they're going to have no service. And so there was an outcry in opposition to high-speed rail from those communities, and it wasn't the direct route into Silicon Valley. In fact, the idea was to bypass Silicon Valley, to go across the new Dumbarton Bridge and go directly into San Francisco. So that, that made, didn't make any sense. So the Pacheco Pass route was chosen on three different independent studies done by three different engineering firms. And that is what's been confirmed. And that's the way it's going to be. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Sorry, I just want to be mindful that we're a little bit over time. So oh. we'll, take, we'll take a couple of questions, one here and one over there, and then maybe wind up. Here are the buses. I I just kind of hang out here. Thank you. Um, the Mercury News is hinting that the high speed rail project may be facing some future lawsuits from, they say, environmental groups. I wonder if you can not elaborate on what that might be all about. Is I'll, I'll that try. Kind of story? I'll try. And some of it's uh, hy hy hypothetical. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, whether it's as accurate as I'd like to be. Um, there's a group from Menlo Park, Atherton, and uh, the northern portion of Palo Alto that has been adamantly opposed to the high-speed train system because they think it's going to cause noise. Well, it's going to actually be a lot quieter than the dirty diesel system that's already there. And they have a lot of money. They're very wealthy people. And they've hired a public relations firm and several attorneys to represent them. And they brought a dozen different legal actions. Every one of those legal actions have been found in favor of the High Speed Rail Project, except one, which required them that the High Speed Rail Project go back and study something again, which they did. And, and the, the data came out again and was upheld by the courts. So, so far, uh, none of the legal actions that have come against the high-speed rail program have, uh, have uh, been detrimental. They've all been found in favor of the high-speed rail project or have been 
are remediable. Now, let me remind you that they built a bridge up there north of San Francisco back in the 1930s. That bridge had 2,300 lawsuits against it at one time. 2,300. And it got built. And now we couldn't imagine having a world without the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, in 20 years, we're not going to be able to imagine a state of California without the high-speed rail system. And uh, the, the other lawsuits that are occurring are lawsuits that I don't, I don't mind. They're typically farmers who are trying to get more money for their land when the high-speed rail system has to buy a little land to, to, uh, to create a wider right-of-way. It's typically along the current railroad tracks. Uh, and that's part of the legal process of getting the best value for your land. And it, there is an advantage in California to bring legal action to require that the price be set by the courts. Because when the price is set by the courts in what's called eminent domain proceedings, then you don't have to pay taxes on what you receive. <laughs> ah, that, that's, that, doesn't take, that doesn't take a brain surgeon to realize that there, maybe there's an advantage. At the same time, there may be a disadvantage in that, the, in that the court sets the price. And oftentimes, it isn't as much as was offered by the buying uh, organization. So there's risk, and there's legal costs, but you certainly save some taxes. It's state taxes. Last question, Rod. Thank you. So in uh, Silicon Valley, BTA serves us as the transit agency, yet their fare box recovery is 10%. We have 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area. It seems that places like Portland and Seattle, right, which are comparable, in, in, in some ways dominated by single story landscapes as you were talking about in Toronto, have gotten the job done better and they're furiously building new light rail lines. Is our problem governance here? Is it that 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area just needs to be consolidated down and we, we need to do more thoughtful maybe uh, and more less political planning or, I mean I've met a lot of good folks that all seem to be wanting to do things, but it seems like sometimes our decisions are siloed between agencies. Caltrain has a hard time, you know, getting funding. And then you look at a place like Portland that all does this centrally. They've got 40% fare box recovery and three times the ridership per capita of VTA. So politically, how would we better organize or think through um, governance and or how we're doing the funding for this, for public transportation? Rod, you're, you're, you're closer to it than any of us right now, being a member of the BTA board. And you, uh, you, I, I'm not, actually. Yeah. Well, we, you were at one time. And, and you're currently chairing the uh, West Valley Corridor Study Group. And good luck to you on that. That's an important study. The answer to your question is twofold. First, the answer is yes. Uh, although we in Santa Clara County are better off than the rest of the region because we have one transit agency, and it's also the congestion management agency, under one uh, body, and that, that body is made up of city council members, a couple of county supervisors, who are delegated to do the responsibility. So you, you're melding the city and, and the transit agency into a pretty visible organization. So we're better off here. What we lack here is, first of all, we, we need to have more money. And we have a, a master plan for transportation, which is kind of based on that click to that I showed you earlier. Uh, it, uh, it is a fine master plan. You know, the commute loop and spoke system with the high speed rail uh, a feeder line uh, for uh, re inter regional travel is an outstanding master plan. But we haven't completed it. And it needs to be done because. Unlike a freeway where you'll drive halfway and then get off on a city street, you can't drive halfway on a, on a half-done transit system. You, there's, there's no way to, to transit after you're halfway there. So you have to complete the system in order for a transit system to work. And we have half of a transit system done in Silicon Valley. So that's 
So, so Portland funds with a 0.73% tax on payroll, and we rely on sales taxes. They have no sales tax in all of Oregon. Is that something we should consider? Or how do we get the funding necessary to get this job done? Uh, the savior in our, our transportation financing programs has been the Silicon Valley Leadership Group that represents the largest manufacturers. Do you think they're going to run the campaign to have a payroll tax? <laughs> I, do, I, do, Rod, I don't want to. We're bumping up against 10%. You, you tell Carl that one. I, I, think, I think we're probably stuck with the sales tax as our funding base. I think we might be able to get a gas tax increase because the gas tax is, is uh, coming down. But it's not a very good tax in terms of transportation because, you know, within 10, 15 years, we're going to be primarily electric cars. And, and you're not going to be selling much gas. So I think, I think, first of all, we ought to be talking regional. We shouldn't be talking just Santa Clara County. We should be talking commuter shed. So we should look at the whole Bay Area, at least the central part of the Bay Area, up through uh, Contra Costa, Alameda County, San Francisco, and so on, which feeds into Silicon Valley now. You got it. You're not going to convince San Francisco of that for a while. But that should be one transit agency. One transit agency with high, high visibility with directly elected board members. And then we need to break through the NIMBY issue. Uh, the thing that's killing us in terms of feeding people into our transit system is being able to densify on top of and around those stations. And right now, as Rod knows, because he's been beaten up, and Larry knows because you've been beaten up when you've tried to do the right thing, the neighbors around those stations go nuts. They don't understand what's happening. They're afraid of density. And we don't explain it to them very well. And so we've got to figure out a way to Educate the NIMBYs so they understand that it, it, by densifying on top of a train station, you're not densifying in the neighborhoods. You put your density on top of the train stations, and people are more likely to ride the trains. And that's the message we've got to get out. That's, that's, that's it's over the top of the parking lots. Well, you need some parking. The, the, uh, so that's that's the issue. Let me let me close now because if I don't, I'm going to get the hook. Um, we've talked about those babies. We've been told by the scientists that we've got maybe 10, 15 years before it's too late. Obviously, too late in terms of climate change. 20 years from now. We're going to have one or two scenarios that have occurred. We've been strong enough to turn this huge ship around, get off of petroleum, get off of other carbon pollution, become electrically powered as a, as a civilization, and avoided the climate change cataclysm. Or the petroleum industry has lobbied until they have sold their last drop of fuel and last lump of coal. And we went beyond the point of no return. And the world is in chaos with civil wars fighting over the last drops of water as we run out of food. One of those two or derivations of one of those two is going to be happening within 15 to 20 years. That's going to happen. When that happens, your dear precious grandchild or child is going to come to you, and they're either going to be happy if we've avoided the cataclysm and they're reading about it in their history classes, or they're going to be dying because we didn't avoid the cataclysm. 
and they're going to look you in the eye and they're going to say, Papa, Mama, did you do all you could possibly do when there was still time? How will you answer them? 